Philippine Pharmaceuticals in association with Higher Secondary Principals Forum. Hello everybody and welcome to yet another lecture in chemistry in this Prudent Scholars series. My name is Mrs. Priyanka Savan, teacher grade 1 at uh, Saraswat Vidyalayas, Purshottam Valavalkar High Secondary School, Mapsa. Students, uh, in this unfortunate pandemic that we are all going through currently, there is so much being heard about and there is so much being spoken, a lot of hype about immunity, isn't it? There's so much being said about having your immune system strong and uh, keeping your body strong, being able to fight any foreign infection. Now, these things were always important, isn't it? It's just that the current scenario is a constant reminder that uh, it is important to pay attention to your health. And if you've tried to find out, you must have definitely known that one of the ways in which you can keep your body strong is by putting in the right amount and the right kind of food. That is to have a healthy diet. Now very often when we do this topic in school, I ask my students what according to you is a healthy diet and uh, very, uh, what do you say, impulsively they come forward and very actively they will come and tell me, in fact any one of you will tell me that a healthy diet is the one in which you take what your body requires in an adequate amount. And what is that? All the nutrients that your body needs, like the carbohydrates, the proteins, fats, the lipids, the vitamins, the minerals, all that your body requires to be taken in an adequate amount. Very true and that's absolutely correct. But at the same time, not just that your body has to take in all this, if you pay careful attention for, for, uh, from head to toe, you are actually made up of all these molecules which are called collectively as the biomolecules. Your body right from the hair, the hair has proteins, the nails, the blood, the blood is hemoglobin. Your blood constantly needs a supply of glucose which is carbohydrates and what not. So all of these are, uh, what do you say, they are very beautifully uh, composed in not just the human body but any living organism may it be the plants may it be the animals may it be the microorganisms like the bacteria the fungi are made up of all these molecules and therefore they are called as the biomolecules sorry which is our topic of discussion today so without wasting any time let's go on further so like I just said a biomolecule is the molecule which occurs in the living organism and they systematically cooperate with each other and help to help your body to sustain and get through. Helps your body to grow, helps your body to fight, etc. etc. There are n number of functions they will cooperate with each other and perform. Now it's a huge topic and practically not possible in one hour's time to touch upon everything. But yes, very, very important things will be just uh, what is discussed in brief. I am saying brief because there is so much to it that we can actually talk on and on and on. So like I said, the molecules that are primarily made up of non-living elements like the carbon, the hydrogen, primarily carbon and hydrogen along with oxygen and other elements like nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, etc. So, because they are present in the living organisms, they are called as the biomolecules. So, among these, two of which we are going to discuss very much a little in detail are the carbohydrates and the proteins and a little bit of the nucleic acids. Okay, so moving on further, carbohydrate. Now, as if you go by the name, as the name says, carbohydrate. Okay, you can actually relate this, uh, what you say, literally to carbo means anything that will be dealing with carbon and hydrate is to do with hydrates. Now, initially carbohydrates were thought to be, now there is a different definition to it, but initially carbohydrates were thought to be hydrates of carbon, 
hydrates are nothing but water molecules so i can write something like this cx h2o y that is having x number whatever the number of carbon atoms is and the carbon atoms will be linked to water molecules some y number so basically it was taught to be carbon linked to different water molecules and hence hydrates of carbon okay however this definition does not hold good to all the carbohydrates which are actually carbohydrates and also does not hold good to some molecules which are not carbohydrates but they do fit into this formula for example the most common carbohydrate that we know glucose we know the formula of glucose is c6h12o6 now there is another way i can write this by clubbing hydrogen and oxygen together to be written as water so i can write this formula also as c6 h2o6 now you can expand this and you get back the previous formula that is c6 will remain the way it is h2 multiplied by 6 gives you 12 hydrogen atoms and oxygen multiplied by 6 gives you 6 uh, oxygen atoms so if you notice that this formula fits into the general formula that i have written here that is c6 cx h2o y so if you correlate this x here takes the number 6 and y here takes the number 6 so basically glucose is a carbohydrate that fits into this generalized formula having some number of carbon atoms and some number of water molecules okay so this is good as of now however there are some molecules like acetic acid now acetic acid we know is a carboxylic acid it is not a carbohydrate but if you simplify the formula that is ch3cooh into a form of this kind okay i can write this as c2 and i can club all the hydrogens and oxygens and write it as water multiplied by 2 so if i open this up i get back the formula now this formula also relates to a formula formula that i have generalized here also fits in this which brings me to the conclusion that even if the formula fits into this formula it may not be a carbohydrate like carboxylic uh, this acetic acid is a carboxylic acid it is not a carbohydrate okay so it's not a carbohydrate further there is another example of carbon uh, carbohydrate rhamnose rhamnose formula is c6h12o5 now this formula if i want to write in this form it is not possible because there are 12 hydrogen atoms and 5 so there is an even number and there is an odd number so i cannot write water molecules in this way at the most what i can write is h2o5 which will leave me with another hydrogen so this is a not a formula that fits into this okay i am i'm hoping you are understanding this and that is why ramnose also cannot fit into this generalized formula so this is only to show you that even if the earlier definition of carbohydrates were all those compounds which are hydrates of carbon it does not hold good reason is there are some molecules of carbon carbohydrates which are actually carbohydrates like ramnose but their formula does not fit into this formula also there are some molecules having a, a formula that fits into this generalized formula but they are not carbohydrates like the acetic acid so if this is not good that has to be a correction made correct and the correction given is carbohydrates are now actually called as optically active you know the optically active comes from the chirality optically active and i have put that in red because that's very important to know that they are polyhydroxy aldehydes or ketones so they are carb carbohydrates are basically containing functional groups of aldehyde or it's a ketone along with hydroxyl groups that is the oh group polyhydroxy indicates uh, what do you say many many oh groups along with an aldehydic group or a ketonic group or there are compounds which give aldehyde or ketone upon hydrolysis give such units upon 
hydrolysis. So what you have to remember, the, remember is basically they will be containing an aldehyde group or a ketonic group along with some OH groups that is hydroxyl groups. Okay, so the first thing that we'll learn is classification of these carbohydrates because having so many types of carbohydrates in different organisms right from the cellulose in the plants, the myelose in the animal, the glucose, the fructose, they are a chunk of them. So there have to be ways of systematically grouping them, correct? And one way that we can group them, one way of classifying them is depending on how many monomers they have. If you know what monomers are, what are monomers? They are the smallest units of any polymer. So a big compound is made up of small units. The smallest of them is called as the monomer. So depending on what are the, how many units of monomers are there, that is one way of classifying carbo carbohydrates. Okay, what do you see next? So there are three major categories of carbohydrates. One is monosaccharides. Okay, let me just mention to you that carbohydrates are also called as saccharides. Sorry about that. They are called as saccharides and depending on the number of the units they have, they are classified as monosaccharides, oligosaccharides and polysaccharides. Now, monosaccharides, as the word says, mono is one. So, all those carbohydrates that have only one unit of the monomer, okay, that is the smallest unit is only one, is called as the monosaccharides. For example, glucose, the simplest one, glucose, fructose, ribose. Fructose is the one that is present in most of your fruits and honey. Then ribose, ribose is a carbohydrate that's a major constituent of the nucleic acids. We're going to learn that further and galactose, which is called as the uh, milk saccharide. Okay, so all these are examples of monosaccharides having only one unit. Then there's another category, oligosaccharide. Now, oligo means literally few. Okay, oligosaccharides are those carbohydrates that contain either two to ten. So, maybe two, maybe three, maybe four, up to ten units of the monomers. Okay, now what do I mean by that? For example, sucrose. Now, sucrose is made up of two types of monomer, monomer unit. One is glucose and the other one is fructose. Okay, so basically it contains, now glucose you know is a monosaccharide, correct? Fructose you also know is a monosaccharide. One unit of glucose and one unit of fructose are linked together. That becomes one unit of sucrose. And because they contain two units of the monosaccharides, they are called as disaccharides. Then if there are three units of monomers, for example, you can see raffnose, it contains glucose, one unit of glucose, one unit of fructose and one unit of galactose. So three units and therefore it is called as a trisaccharide. Likewise, there is stichose which contains four units of monomers. One is glucose, one is fructose and it contains two units of galactose. So all of these single units like single glucose is a monosaccharide, single fructose is a monosaccharide but glucose and fructose together makes a oligosaccharide. Okay, so what are oligosaccharides? All those saccharides, all those carbohydrates that contain either 2 to 10 units of the monosaccharide, either 2, either 3, 4, up to 10 units. So oligo technically means few, having few units. So that's oligosaccharides and then things get even more complicated about 10 units. If there are more than 10 monosaccharides that are linked together, then they are not called as oligosaccharides, then they will be called as polysaccharides. Poly means many, right? So if you have many units, for example, starch. Starch is the major component in plants, correct? Now starch is made up of number of, n number of uh, glucose units linked together. So that's polysaccharides. So this is one way of classifying them broadly depending on how many monomers you have. Further, 
there is another way of classifying carbohydrates there are sugars called as reducing sugars and there are sugars called as non reducing sugars now this you would have known a little better if we were learning disaccharides but unfortunately that portion is deleted for evaluation for this year but anyway now those which can reduce if you have heard of tollens solution and felling solution those sugars which can reduce tollens and fellings are called as reducing those which cannot are called as non reducing now this depends if if whether they have a carbonyl group free or not okay now i'm not going into detail of that not required for now so just remember there are again there's, there's this category called as reducing sugars and non reducing sugars further again monosaccharides we said monosaccharides are single units that means having only one unit of monomer however that single unit of monomer may have many carbon atoms so depending on how many number of carbon atoms are there they are further classified okay now there is this table you have to follow for example in general it is to be added as os okay so if there are if the monosaccharide contains three carbon atoms three is tri so they are called as triose if there are four four is tetra that will be called as tetrose then five will be called as pentose and so on i told you way back that carbohydrates contain either an aldehyde or a ketone depending on whether it contains aldehyde or ketone that monosaccharide will be further so called for example if it contains an aldehyde and if it contains three carbon atoms it will be called as aldo triose aldo for aldehyde tri for uh, three carbon atoms and it is to be the sugars are to be added with os so aldo triose and if it's a ketonic group it will be called as keto triose for example glucose glucose we know the formula c6h12o6 there are six carbon atoms and the functional group in glucose is an aldehyde fructose also has the same formula the only difference between glucose and fructose is the functional group glucose contains an aldehyde whereas fructose contains a ketone therefore glucose having six carbon atoms will be called as aldo hexose fructose with six carbon atoms and a ketonic group will be called as keto hexose so this is one way of classifying monosaccharides depending on the number of carbon atoms and depending on the functional group whether it's aldehyde or ketone so you have to remember further when we are learning glucose in detail that glucose is a aldo hexose whereas fructose is a keto hexose hexose because both of them have six carbon atoms okay so both these glucose and fructose we are going to learn a little in detail more importantly they are chemical structure okay so moving on glucose is one of the most important carbohydrate you know anybody just needs energy quickly he is given glucose to boost the energy it is found in fruits honey any uh, sweet vegetables then grapes has a large amount now how can you prepare glucose commercially if you if i go back i told you here see this sucrose sucrose is made up of glucose and fructose so if you want to prepare glucose you can simply take sucrose and break it down hydrolyze it hydrolyze is breaking down of it it will give you glucose and fructose also starch starch is also made up of glucose correct so if you are able to hydrolyze starch it will break down into its constituent which is nothing but glucose so that is how commercially uh, glucose is prepared okay so there is one way of preparing glucose from sucrose why because sucrose is made up of one unit of glucose and one unit of fructose so you simply hydrolyze this with an acid like hcl or h2so4 it will break down into its constituents that is glucose and fructose so that's one way another one that we discussed just now that it is present in starch which is a polysaccharide so you can simply on a commercial basis you can break down or hydrolyze this 
starch it will break down into its constituent that is glucose okay so sometimes uh, our uh, what do you say question papers you will find this question and it is also important on a commercial scale how how it is prepared okay now what next is we have to learn the structure of glucose now what we are learning in this part is basically how to deduce the structure of glucose now consider that you know nothing about glucose except that you know its formula the formula is C6H12O6 and you know nothing else you don't know how these carbon atoms are bonded to each other you do not know how the hydrogen and the oxygen is bonded to carbon or within themselves you know nothing so then how do you deduce the structure this is what is done to any unknown substance uh, that you analyze what you do is you perform different tests okay and you treat the results of this test as evidences and you put it all together and use all your knowledge and that's how you deduce the structure okay and that is exactly what we are going to do with glucose so there are some reactions of glucose that you have to be knowing and the inferences from those reactions and then you club all that and you deduce the structure of glucose okay so what is the first thing you first thing you know is its formula and you also know because i'm telling you now that it is called as dextrose okay now why dextrose if you know uh, that dextro rotatory and levo rotatory okay glucose is a compound that is dextro rotatory how do you find this dextro or levo rotatory it has nothing to do with the structure dextro rotatory and levo rotatory i mean you cannot look at the structure and find out that is what i mean what you have to be doing is to find out whether it's dextro or levo rotatory you have to put it in the instrument if it rotates the light of uh, plane polarized light to the right it is dextro rotatory if it rotates the light to the left it is levo rotatory so when you take glucose you take the substance and you put it in the polarimeter it will rotate the light to the right that is how you know that it is dextro rotatory so that's another thing you have to know now because it is dextro rotatory it is called as dextrose further we know that it's a monomer in many carbohydrates like starch and cellulose starch i just now told you that is entirely made up of n n number of glucose units now what are the reactions these reactions are very important okay the first reaction is when you treat glucose with hydrogen iodide what you get is a n hexane now what's an n hexane hexane is having six number of carbon atoms all linked in a straight chain so this shows that first of all the six carbon atoms that are present must be all linked in a straight chain there is no branching this is what you come to know from this evidence because on treating with hi that is hydrogen iodide it gives n hexane so from here this is what i infer okay first thing i get to know is the skeleton of the glucose the structure skeleton is that the carbon atoms are all arranged in a straight line then further there are some reactions like if you treat glucose with hydroxyl amine it will form an oxane now this is a typical reaction of a carbonyl group okay an aldehyde group in fact if you treat any aldehyde group with hydroxyl amine it will give you an oxane similarly there's another reaction which is also very typical of carbonyl group that is when you treat it with hcn it adds on hydrogen cyanide to give you cyanohydrin okay so you have to pay attention to this i have not written the structure i have written only the formula but what you get is a c double bond o a c double bond o that is a carbonyl group will break and you get an added product h it is hcn right cn and hydrogen this oxygen already belongs to the compound now these two reactions are typical reactions of a carbonyl group so if glucose is showing both these reactions it straight away indicates that there must be one carbonyl group okay so this is what 
So if you are asked to give a reaction, for example, to prove the presence of a carbonyl group, you can give one of these, okay, or both of these. Okay, so what do we know as of now? From the first reaction that is treatment with HI, we know that the six carbon atoms are all linked in a straight chain. And the second thing we know is that there is a carbonyl group, okay. The next thing is you get to know that the carbonyl group is not a ketonic group, but it's an aldehyde group. Why? Because when it is treated, when glucose is treated or when it is oxidize using a mild oxidizing agent like bromine water the aldehyde group gets oxidized to carboxylic group okay or the carbonyl group gets oxidized easily to carboxylic group which indicates the presence of an aldehyde group because this is you're using a mild oxidizing agent this is an uh, the, the reaction which is shown by aldehyde group okay any aldehyde group with mild oxidizing agent will quickly get oxidized to carboxylic group. So this, uh, what do you say, this is an uh, evidence for the presence of an aldehyde group. So what do we know as of now? First, we know that the carbon atoms are all linked in a straight chain. Second, we know that there is a carbonyl group from the previous two reactions. A carboxylic group that is aldehyde group uh, gets oxidized to carboxylic group and hence this is what we arrive at that there are carbon atoms and there is a carbonyl group. The carbonyl group is actually an aldehyde group and not a ketonic group. Now the next reaction is acetylation of glucose with acetic anhydride. Now, now this is a typical example of an alcoholic group. A OH group gives you an acetic. A glucose pentaacetate is what you get on treatment of glucose with acetic anhydride. So this is an evidence that there are, since it is giving pentaacetate, there are five OH groups in the glucose molecule. Now we know that a, uh, what do you say, OH group cannot be, th there cannot be two or more OH groups present on one carbon atom because then it makes the compound unstable. But glucose is very much stable. So the five OH groups as indicated by this reaction uh, must be present on five different carbon atoms okay so as of now that is what we infer one there are six carbon atoms in a straight chain second there's a carbonyl group the carbonyl group is actually an aldehyde group because on reaction with bromine water which is a mild oxidizing agent the aldehyde group gets oxidized to carboxylic group also with the uh, acetic anhydride it gives penta acetate penta indicates that there must be five OH groups and these five OH groups must be present on five different carbon atoms because glucose is a stable molecule further on strong oxidation that is with nitric acid because nitric acid is a strong oxidizing agent we get a dicarboxylic acid which is called acid which is called as the sacric acid and that's the formula of the sacric acid with two COOH groups at two terminals which indicates that there must be a primary alcoholic group there has to be one primary alcoholic group so this indicates that the two COOH group is a result of oxidation of both the aldehyde group as well as the primary uh, alcoholic group. The aldehyde group gets oxidized to COOH and also the primary, uh, the primary alcoholic group also gets oxidized to COOH group. Now with all these evidences, that is the formula, the chemical reactions and everything you can put together and Fisher gave a, a way of projecting this, that is a way of writing this called as the Fisher projection and this is what he proposed very very important the open structure of glucose was precisely proposed to be like this with the correct orientation of the OH group now what do I mean by that so first thing there are six carbon atoms all linked in a straight chain second there is a carbonyl group which is the aldehyde group so since it's an aldehyde group it has to be in the terminal so that's the group that is C double bond OH which is the aldehyde group. Then there is one 
primary OH group which will have to be put in the other end because it's a primary and you're left with four OH groups and precisely these OH groups have to be oriented like this. What I mean by that? The one that is on the second carbon has to be on the right, left, right, right and that's precisely the structure, open chain structure of glucose which is arrived using all those evidences that is all those reactions that we discussed all this time and it is to be named as D plus glucose. Now let me explain to you what this is. Plus comes from its optical activity. You have to remember this that the plus is because sorry the plus is because it is dextrorotatory okay. It is either written as small d and small l for dextrorotatory, levorotatory or it is written as plus and minus. So we have learned earlier that glucose is a dextrose because it uh, is dextrorotatory and therefore this plus. Now what is this d? Now the capital D is not to be confused with the optical activity. This capital D is coming from its configuration that is from the structure okay how is you have to look at the OH which is on the fifth carbon okay if this OH is on the right hand side so here it is on the right hand side so the D is not to be confused with the small d and l which is for optical activity here the D is for configuration and the plus is for indicating that it is dextrorotatory. So let me talk about configuration again. So I was saying you have to look at this OH which is on the fifth carbon. Why the fifth carbon? The carbon which is adjacent to the terminal carbon. So the terminal carbon here is carbon number 6, adjacent to that is carbon number 5. So if the OH is on the right hand side of the carbon then it is to be called as capital D, to be written as capital D. Now this is compared, the D, capital D and L is compared uh, to glyceraldehyde which is taken as a standard. Okay, now I am not taking that in detail here, just remember that you have to look at the carbon which is adjacent to the terminal carbon. So that's how you have it called as capital D plus glucose. Uh, so yes, it is correctly named as D plus glucose, D is because the OH is on the right hand side, which OH? The OH which is adjacent to the terminal carbon and the plus is because it is dextrorotatory. D or L comes from the structure. You have to look at the structure and predict whether it is D and L, D or L and plus minus cannot be predicted from the structure. Plus minus is to be predict predicted by using the instrument. Further, the letter in D and L is therefore uh, because of the configuration it has nothing to do with the optical activity. Now it does not end here, this is just the open structure. Now so having said that it does not give the 2,4 DNP test, it does not give the shift test, it does not form hydrogen sulphide, it indicates that the CHO group even though it is present it must be not free, suggesting therefore that it must be therefore bonded with something and the structure may not be free and it must be a cyclic structure. Therefore, it was suggested that uh, the following are the possibilities how it can form the uh, cyclic structure. Why? So you know that the carbonyl group because there is an electronegativity difference, oxygen is more electronegative than carbon and therefore you, I can say that because of the electronegativity difference here, carbon will slightly get a positive charge, carbon will slightly get a positive charge, a partial positive charge and oxygen will get a partial negative charge that comes from the electronegativity difference. Now because this carbon is slightly electropositive, it has an affinity, you see there are so many OH groups here and the oxygens are electron rich. There are so many electrons available here and therefore this carbon which is less in electrons and less in negative charge 
feels greedy for these electrons. So it could attract these electrons and form a new bond. Now if it, if it attracts this one that is from carbon number 2, if it attracts the one that is on carbon number 2, it will form a very very small cycle. That's a very tiny cycle and there will be a lot of strain. Likewise, even this will be small. So the preferred cycle or the preferred bond it forms is with the oxygen that is on carbon number 5. There is actually a tendency for any of these but actually it forms with carbon number 5 and there are various reasons actually different scientists have put up to explain why 5 and why not the others. Okay, because of because then there is strain and there is stress and so much uh, that comes into picture. So it is the oxygen that is on carbon number 5 that will form a new bond with the carbonyl carbon that is carbon number 1. How? Here. The oxygen has lone pair of electrons that will be attracted by the carbon. Now this carbon already has its 4 bonds. So if there is a new bond that is being formed between carbon, this oxygen and of course the hydrogen will get lost from here, it, the oxygen gets deprotonated that is hydrogen is lost. Okay? So there is a new bond between the electrons of oxygen that is forming a bond with carbon and since this carbon already has a 4, bond, four bonds 1, 2, 3, 4 and there is another one that is being formed now, one of the bond will have to move. So it is this that moves with, uh, with a pair of electrons onto oxygen. So therefore you see that there is a new bond between carbon, the oxygen and this carbon that is carbon number 1 and then what happens to the oxygen? Oxygen becomes O- minus because it gets lone pair of electrons from this bond and it picks up the proton. So you have now generated a new carbon oxygen carbon bond which is this which is shown in dotted carbon oxygen carbon that is the new bond forming a cycle. Also the oxygen which was already there now will pick up this H with the, with the lone pair on electrons will pick up this H and form and generate a new OH. This is very important that the new OH that is formed you will have to place this now where either on the right hand side or on the left hand side and that is also very important because that is how then you have another two isomers of glucose called as anomers. If you put the OH on the right hand side, it is called as the alpha anomer. Alpha ones are the ones in which the OH on the carbon which was earlier the carbonyl carbon which was a functional group and now it is called as the anomeric carbon. If the OH is on the right, it will be called as alpha glucose and if the OH is on the left, it will be called as beta glucose. Okay, so let me just put this up again. What is happening here? Oxygen having lone pair of electrons here gets attracted by this carbon. Why? Because this carbon is electron, uh, what do you say, electropositive. Okay, it has partial positive charge and therefore there will be a new bond between carbon, oxygen, this carbon. Okay, and this hydrogen will be lost and it will be pick up picked up by the oxygen forming a OH. So that OH that is formed has to be put either on the right or to the left, the new OH. So it is this OH. So the carbon number 1 which was earlier before cyclization, the carbon was a carbonyl carbon. Now after cyclization, the carbon has another new OH onto it. Now that carbon is now called as an anomeric carbon and if the OH is on the left hand side of that anomeric carbon, it is called as the beta anomer and if the OH is on the right hand side of the anomeric carbon, it is called as the alpha anomer. So this alpha and beta are two anomers of glucose. Also you have to pay attention that now that it has cyclized, it is forming a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 carbon atoms and 1 oxygen, total 6 uh, member ring. 
okay so basically the cyclic structure of glucose is a six membered ring out of which one is an oxygen and five carbon atoms so this is all coming in the ring so what we have to do next is write the ring structure okay which is called as the havoc projection before that the ring so formed is called as a hemiacetal ring okay because because it's an aldehyde and it's forming an hemiacetal so you have hemiacetal and you have hemiketal so what next is writing this structure in the ring form so we said that glucose exists in two different forms alpha and beta which is which is called as the anomers alpha i told you because of the oh on the right beta because the oh is on the left now from here we have to write its something called as havoc projection have this this way of writing is it, it is fischer projection and havoc projection is writing the cyclic structure of the open structure cyclic structure now here you know how many things are coming in the cycle so this carbon that's carbon number 1 carbon number 2 3 4 5 this is all coming in cycle and also the oxygen is coming in cycle so it's a six member ring so first thing you do is from here to here how to draw draw a six member ring what's a six member ring a hexagon okay so you typically have to draw a hexagon with one of the corners occupied by oxygen this is what okay the next thing is you put dashes like this on every corner to indicate other uh, groups present on that carbon okay so then next you number them so i have started from here this is oxygen oxygen is bonded to this what is this carbon number 1 so next to oxygen you can start this way also or you can start this way clockwise or anti clockwise the way you want so oxygen is bonded to carbon number 1 so next to oxygen that corner i'm going to call it carbon number 1 so i number this carbons now so that's my carbon number 1 next is carbon 2 carbon 3 carbon 4 carbon 5 what next what is there on carbon number 1 on carbon 1 there is a hydrogen and there is a oh which you have to put on this carbon hydrogen and oh how to go about this whatever is on the right hand side okay remember this whatever is on the right hand side is to be put down okay now what's on the right hand side of carbon number 1 oh so i put my oh down on carbon number 2 what is on the right oh so i have put my oh down on carbon 3 what is on right hydrogen so i put my hydrogen down and so on so on carbon 4 there is oh on the right i put it down on carbon 5 now here you have to be careful on carbon 5 there is no right and left you see there is ch to oh now this is a big group for convenience the big group is not put inside the ring it is to be put up so i put ch to oh up and i put h down okay and then rest of the things you put so what is there on carbon 1 other than oxygen hydrogen so yes hydrogen hydrogen on this is oh and then there is h so that is the way of writing a havoc projection from open structure how you write meaning from feature projection this is cyclic of course from feature how do you write havoc that is the way okay so whatever is on the right has to be put down remember that and just how many member ring is there you see and draw a skeleton then put the dashes and fill up that's all okay so that's the structure there are two anomers we said alpha and beta alpha because this oh is on the right and here beta because this oh is on the left what we just discussed all this time rest everything remains the same and this from here that's a fischer projection you have to draw the uh havoc projection so that's the alpha anomer and that's the beta alpha is what we just drew and beta is will be just the opposite only a carbon number 1 rest everything remains the same okay so this is what we discussed the hemiacetal cyclic rings of glucose differ only at the configuration at carbon number 1 rest all configurations are same so you see the beauty of chemistry with only one uh what do you say not even the element changing the elements are same just that the spatial configuration is changing only with right and left the whole molecule changes okay so you have 
whole molecule different alpha and different beta. So because of this similarity with a six membered ring wherein there is one oxygen and five carbon atoms is similar to the structure of cyclic structure of glucose that we just learned. Glucose is correctly named as alpha D plus glucopyranose. Okay? So you have to know each term why it is so called glucopyranose because gluco because it's glucose pyranose because it has similarity with the pyran ring plus is because it is dextrorotatory and not from the structure D is because the OH on the adjacent carbon to the terminal is on the right hand side and alpha is because the OH on the anomeric carbon is on the right hand side. So that is the complete name of glucose and this is the complete cyclic structure of glucose with each term you have to know why it is so called. That is about glucose now similarly there is another very very important uh, monosaccharide just like glucose having the same formula having the same number of carbon atoms hydrogen oxygen atoms which is fructose okay which is found in most of our fruits and it is present in honey and it is having the same formula as fructose uh, as glucose however just that it is ketohexose okay I told you earlier also glucose is a aldohexose whereas fructose is a ketohexose keto because there is a ketonic group hexose because there are six carbon atoms and uh, it is obtained along with glucose the hydrolysis of sucrose the difference between glucose and fructose is one is its functional group and number two its rotation okay fructose is levorotatory whereas glucose we saw it is called as dextrose why because it is dextrorotatory that is why we put plus in that bracket because it is dextrorotatory glucose fructose on the other hand is levorotatory now just a happy news for you that you do not have to know the evidences to arrive at the structure like for glucose you have to know this equations no you have to know what happens with HI what happens with uh, 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 with the hydrazine all those you do not have to know, sorry not hydrazine with the si hydrogen cyanide you do not have to know those for fructose straight away jumping on to the structure that is the open structure straight ready for you of uh, fructose which is called as the Fischer projection six carbon atoms all linked in a straight chain there is a ketonic group you know the ketonic group cannot be terminal carbon so it is carbon number two that is the ketonic group and also you have to know the arrangement of OH this is on the left this is on the right this is on the right similarly just like glucose fructose is also known to exist in the cyclic form for similar reason what is the reason the carbonyl carbon which is having a partial positive charge why does it have a partial positive charge because of the electronegativity difference between carbon and oxygen we discussed this for glucose because carbon has a partial positive charge it has affinity it is greedy for these electrons there are so many electrons here that it can attract in fact it does not attract these but same carbon number 5 the oxygen on the carbon number 5 forms a new bond with carbon that is carbon number 2 here so how many membered ring will you get in this case you will get 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 carbons and a new bond between carbon, oxygen and carbon I am showing it to you in, in the next slide here same way just like we did for glucose same thing for fructose so here there is a new bond between let me show you in this case it is this oxygen that will be having a lone pair which will be attracted by which carbon this carbonyl carbon obviously this bond cannot then sustain with its electron it will go to oxygen and this hydrogen will be lost oxygen gets deprotonated and this hydrogen is then picked up by this oxygen 
okay so there is a new bond between carbon oxygen carbon and there is a new oh generated from where from this oxygen picking up the hydrogen similar to what we learnt in glucose so i've straight away shown you this structure so the oh the new oh that is formed can either be on the right or it can be on the left okay so this becomes the anomeric carbon now this carbon which was earlier the carbonyl carbon before cyclization is now called as the anomeric carbon so if the new generated oh is on the right hand side then it will be called as alpha and if the new generated oh is on the left hand side it will be called as beta and how many member ring now does it form 1 2 3 4 carbons and plus 1 oxygen so total five member ring so from here how to draw the havoc projection also we have learned for glucose so what you have to do is draw five member ring what's a five member ring a pentagon so draw a pentagon 1 2 3 4 5 and in one corner you put oxygen then put your dashes that it was shown to you earlier put all your dashes and then how do you go about from writing here the, from this to this whatever is on the right hand side is to be put down correct so on carbon number now this is your oxygen this is carbon number 1 this carbon so on carbon number 1 what is on the right oh so i put that oh down on carbon number 2 what is on the right hydrogen so i put my hydrogen down on carbon number 3 what is on the right oh oh goes down on carbon number 4 you have two groups that is ch2oh and h so ch2oh by convention for convenience goes up it, it is to be put up okay and same way you go about writing the uh, structure for the beta anomer it is the same thing if you have understood this well glucose how to go about you will be able to write fructose very easily all that you have to remember for fructose is the carbonyl carbon is on carbon number 2 that's the carbonyl carbon and the ring is formed between same carbon 5 and the carbonyl carbon okay and once you form a ring how is the ring formed between carbon oxygen and carbon what happens to the oxygen that was already there it forms oh h comes from where this hydrogen so that new oh has to be put either on the right or to the left if you put it on the right it becomes alpha if you put it on the left it becomes beta if it is alpha it is to be called as alpha d fructofuranose why d if you are thinking because it is anything to do with dextro or levo then sorry you have mistaken this d is why because here i'm showing you the open structure this oh which is adjacent to the terminal carbon this oh is on the right and that is why it is d that comes from the configuration okay so hence it's alpha d fructo furanose why furanose okay i think i didn't mention to you this furanose because it is to be compared just like glucose is compared to the pyran ring I'm going back glucose is compared to a pyran ring what's a pyran ring a six membered ring with one oxygen five carbons likewise a five membered ring is having four carbons that's 1 2 3 4 four carbons and one oxygen so that's a furan ring so because it has an analogy to the furan ring it's called as furanose that's fructo furanose so because of the similarity with furan it's called as furanose and the complete name is therefore either alpha d fructo furanose or alpha d a beta d fructo furanose so that's about fructose and in fact that is all about carbohydrates uh, for now we'll stop here and the next topic that is proteins we shall continue in the next lecture thank you very much prudent scholars powered by lupin pharmaceuticals